right behind you. Good morning. I'm Donald Ware, here to introduce Maurice Cottrell from England, now living in Ireland. I find his uh, title today very intriguing, The Secrets of the Super Gods. Maurice is an engineer and a scientist. He has a deg degrees in electrical and communications engineering and a degree in business. He did speak here uh, about 10 years ago at our conference. We found that interesting. He is an author of six books. I believe you see the titles up there, ranging from the Mayan prophecies in 1995 to the Celtic Chronicles, 2005. I don't want to take any more of his time, so let me introduce, please welcome Maurice Cottrell. Thanks. Hi there. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you very much for the introduction. I'm sorry about the confusion this morning. Uh, I find this everywhere I go. People are trying to be helpful, and they, they offer me a Rolls Royce, and all I want is a Model T Ford. And uh, it often presents problems like this. The difficulty with this kind of material is that it's just so unusual, so very, very unusual. Now, you may think, what's this got to do with UFOs? Well, it's got a great deal to do with the UFOs, as we'll see as the morning unfolds. Now, I always feel... Uh, when I begin a talk like this, it reminds me of uh, the old story about the guy who goes into a shoe shop and the assistant says, what size do you take? And he says, well, I normally take an eight, but nine feels so much more comfortable, I think I'll have a ten. <laughs> However, it's, it's sort of back-to-front way of uh, an analogy using that story because normally this stuff takes about 16 hours to talk about. I've done it in eight hours, and today I've got to do it in three and a half. So I'll just, uh, by way of introduction, I'll just try and describe how I got interested in this kind of, uh, this area of research, which covers everything in life. There's, there's no stone unturned that this doesn't touch. When I was eight years old, I used to keep pigeons as a small boy in Manchester, England, where I grew up. And uh, I used to take the pigeons about five miles away on my bicycle and release them. And I noticed that the birds flew around once or twice in a circle and then headed for home across the horizon. And as they went, they zigzagged all the way until it, they got home before me, of course, because I went back and they were already home. And I began to question, how could a, a, a pea-brained, or a bird with the size of a pea, find its way home over such long distances? I had to wait another 12 years after that until I went to sea in the Merchant Navy in England as a radio officer and I was standing on board the, uh, the, the, standing in the wheelhouse on board the ship uh, and we were in a storm and every time a wave came over the ship went to the left and I noticed the gyro compass would skew around and then the rudder at the back would go the opposite way and the ship would come back on course and when I looked at the course recorder I could see the course recorder was following a zigzag so it seemed to me that the pigeons must be sensing the magnetic field, just like the gyro compass was sensing uh, the movement of the ship. So I, I, I joined my first ship. Uh, it was in uh, February 1970. We sailed down the Manchester Ship Canal, and I begin to notice behavioral changes in the crew. When we went north to south, they were quite happy, but when we started going east to west, they all started to argue. And I watched this over the years that followed, the 12, 13 years that followed, and I started to analyze the behavior of the crew and consider what might be making their behavior change as we moved from left to right. Now, in those days, those were the days of the brand new jetliners, the 707, and uh, jet lag was really unheard of then. But we became more familiar with the fact that when we move across the magnetic lines of force on the Earth, that uh, our brains are affected and we produce more or less of the timing hormone, melatonin. Since then, we've come a long way uh, with understanding how uh, the endocrine system hormones work. I became very interested in astrology, or the, the determination of personality. How could, the astrologers, as the astrologers say, the stars affect a human being? 
Well, being rational and logical, I decided it's got to have something to do with the genes. It's got to be in the genes. There must be a scientific explanation for all this. After all, I'd seen the effects on board ship. So, I guess I was born at a lucky time because there were many changes in uh, scientific discoveries during the 70s and 50s, 60s, 70s. Many scientific discoveries around the time. One of them, for example, in 1957, was the discovery of the Van Allen belts, the belts of radiation uh, that encircle the Earth. And James Van Allen, the American engineer who worked at NASA, discovered these in 1957. And uh, we now understand that these belts absorb the radiation from the sun and protect the Earth. In 1961, the next development came from Mariner 2 spacecraft. And uh, Mariner 2 spacecraft sent back signals of particles that were de being detected from the sun. At the time, we couldn't understand what they are, but now we're familiar with them. And the sun, it was seemed, was spinning and sprinkling out particles towards the Earth. Positive particles for seven days, negative particles for seven days, positive particles for about four, and then we get some mixture here of both, and then another sector of particles. Now these particles, the positive charges are the nuclei of the hydrogen atom as we get nuclear fusion in the sun. The negative particles are electrons that are smashed off the atom, and we now know they travel to Earth and they get caught up in these Van Allen belts. Now I've put together this model of the sun, and uh, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? sphere, uh, and uh, that's better, put it there. And This is the sun and this is the earth, and the earth goes around the sun once every 365 days. We now know that the sun has four bubbles of magnetic field around its equator, one, two, three, four, and it has a north pole and a south pole. Every 11 years, the north pole changes polarity, the top becomes minus, the bottom becomes positive. Now, in the next three or four minutes, you're going to get slightly confused. And you say, what's this guy talking about? This is, uh, you know, this is out of my area of activity. I need to go through this process just for a few minutes, and then you'll understand why I want to confuse you for a few minutes. So let me make it quite clear. Now, what I did was, in 1989, while working at Cranfield University, I, I had a question of, how long would it take the three magnetic fields or the three uh, parameters? Excuse me. <laughs> okay. The sun, now we know from Mariner 2, spins every 28 days. And we know the Earth goes round every 365 days. But we also have the planet Mercury here, on here. And Mercury moves round every 87 days. So Mercury moves four degrees a day around the sun. And as it does so, the gravitational field and the magnetic field pull the middle of the sun around more quickly than the top and the bottom. So I asked a question, when would the polar magnetic field, that's the blue one, and the, and the equatorial magnetic field come back together if they started off? And I, I was working at Cranfield, so I had access to the biggest computer at the time in the UK. And I wanted to know when these three variables would all be back together, because that would be a cycle of magnetic activity. Now, I knew that this one, the North Pole, rotates every 37 days. If you're on the Earth, because the Earth has moved during that 37 days, it takes longer. It's 40 days altogether. The equator goes around once every 26 days. But if you're on the Earth, it takes two days longer to line up 28 days. So I thought there had to be a way of calculating when these two magnetic fields and the Earth are all in a line again. Astronomers said, this is impossible. You've got one magnetic field there and one magnetic field there. How can you describe the Sun's magnetic field with regard to the Earth? It's impossible. So I thought about this, and I thought, well, it's not impossible, because I know every 87 days they overlap. This, the pole is overlapping the equator every 87 days. They're both moving, but every 87 days, the North Pole overlaps the equator. So I thought, if I close my eyes for 87 days and only open them after 87 days, they will both be glued together. 
And if I close my eyes for 87 days again and move them around, in 87 days they'd both be glued together but in a different position. In a mathematical sense, this is differentiating the polar cap with respect to the equator. It's called, Isaac Newton invented differentiation in calculus. So this is what I applied that to, but with rotational variables. And I was able to put a graph together. Once these two were glued together, I could then make a graph of the sun's magnetic field in regard to the Earth. And the results were very interesting. I'll come back to that in a few seconds. But now we know why. We get seven days negative particles coming to the Earth from the Sun. Then we get seven days positive particles, seven days negative particles, seven days positive particles. But what we know is that if these two begin rotating together, the blue one and the equator, because the equator is going more quickly, the blue one falls behind. So that after one month, the blue one has moved backwards through field number one. There's one, two, three, four. During the next month, the North Pole will move back through field number two. So if you're on the Earth, you won't see number two that month. What you'll see is one, three, and four. The next month, the North Pole will move through number two. So you won't see number two that month. Three, sorry. You will see one, two, and four. So every month, the polar cap burns out one of those sectors. And we see this here, the polar cap sliding backwards, where the particles are both negative and positive as the North Pole slides through them. Now, during the 19, uh, about 1927, a German psychologist, Johannes Lange, did some studies on twins. He wanted to find out if behavior uh, was genetic or whether or not it was caused by environmental influences. And he took uh, 15 sets of twins and he studied the ones that had been separated at birth, the ones where one twin had gone to America and one had stayed in, for example, Europe. And he noticed that the, each twin committed the same criminal act at the same age throughout their lives. And therefore he concluded that uh, it must be a function of heredity. In other words, that they must inherit these criminal tendencies. Uh, now, he was almost right, but he was a victim of his own research. Because if we look at the siblings here of the, of the twins, these are the sets of twins, the Ostag twins, the Lauterbeck twins, the, the Ryder twins, and so on, and the brothers, we have Alan, for example, A, and K, for example, Kevin, that at the age of 23, one committed fraud and embezzlement, and Kevin, for him, it was at the age of 26. But the parents had no criminal records, and the brothers and sisters, one had a record, but none had, but he had epileptic fit. When we analyze the data, what we find is we would expect the brothers and sisters to have a criminal tendency, just like their twin brothers and sisters, with a ratio of one to four. But this doesn't happen here. So although Lange was correct, it was genetic, it wasn't necessarily down to heredity. It didn't necessarily come from the parents. In other words, if we had a deck of cards from the parents, the cards could be shuffled up after uh, the parents had released the sperm and the ovum. That's when the cards deck was shuffled, and that's when the personality was created. So I analyzed the, the four types of radiation. If you remember, during the first month of solar activity, we lost field sector num number one. So what we had was, when we didn't have number one, we had two, three, and four, which was two positive, three negative, four positive. Two positives and one negative means it was positive. The next month, we didn't have number two, which was a positive. But we had number one, which was negative, and number three, which was negative, so we've got two negatives and a positive. The next month, we didn't have number three. The next month, we didn't have number four. And then they repeat it, of course, because once you've gone through the four, you have to start again. I'm now explaining how astrology works, by the way. A few years later, uh, in 1982, uh, a professor, Ian Nicholson, in, uh, in England, discovered that when the particles leave the Van Allen belts, uh, sorry, when the solar particles impinge upon the Van Allen belts, the particles go up and down from North Pole to South Pole every one second, and the magnetic field on the Earth 
varies, it modulates. And uh, just after that, in 1989, uh, Dr. Ross Aidy, who was President Reagan's medical advisor, discovered that, uh, excuse me, a team at the Naval, Mer uh, Naval Institute at Bethesda, Maryland, discovered that magnetic fields in the overhead lights were causing genetic mutations in their test tubes. So here we have a mechanism whereby particles leave the sun, there's four types of radiation. Every month we get number one, number two, number three, number four. Four different types of radiation. Those particles travel to Earth, the magnetic field on the Earth changes to either a number one, either a number two, or number three, or number four. When the sperm enters the egg, the magnetic fields from the Van Allen belts shake up the genes in the egg as it's developing. And what we have then, because we've got four types of genes, we have four types of personality. For example, uh, fire, Aries, Taurus, uh, Gemini, and Cancer. And then, of course, the sun gets back to where it started, and it repeats. With, uh, we have another fire sign, Leo, followed by uh, Virgo, followed by uh, Sagittarius, uh, or whatever. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> I'm trying to think ahead. So we understand how the genes are shaken up. Now, this is, this is not new. Here's a, uh, an, uh, a stained glass window from Hengrave Hall in England, which is 15th century church. And here we see God the Son uh, with, with his breath, blowing his breath, the solar wind, onto the earth in the middle here. And we see the signs of the zodiac on the outside. And God had in, has in his hand the sun, the sphere of the sun there. So what we find is that even around 1450, uh, 600 years ago, the ancients understand how the solar wind affected life on Earth and created the 12 types of personality. I then started to consider, it was all very well saying, well, we understand that the sun affects behavior, but how could I measure that? How could I check it? So I considered that perhaps what, we, what I was saying was that the sun affects the endocrine system and that affects the genes when we, the, egg, the sperm enters the egg. So is there any other way that I could measure changes in the endocrine system, the hormones, and the sun? So I thought, well, the most obvious measure would be to measure the 28-day signal of the sun and see if any of the hormones, female hormones, change every 28 days. And uh, here we have the sun. We've got 28 days negative, 28 days positive, negative, positive, and I've drawn that out as a sine wave, positive, negative, positive, negative. Now what I'm saying is, does anything happen to the female hormones after day 7, 14, 21, or 28? If that does, then I can say, well, the sun is regulating hormones, and that's the causal uh, agent, if you like. So I had a look at the 28-day uh, cycle of the female hormones, oestrogen and progesterone, and I equated these with a follicle stimulating hormone here, which is responsible for kick-starting the luteinizing hormone and the production of oestrogen and progesterone. And on the face of it, there was no, on first inspection, there was no correlation. In other words, I said, what happens to the follicle stimulating hormone after seven days? Well, nothing, not a lot's going on. What happens after 14 days? Not a lot. What happens after 21? Not a lot. Then what I decided to do was I put this follicle stimulating hormone graph here, that's this one here, and I put it on top of the 28-day cycle like so, and I rotated it like so. And what I've discovered was that the follicle stimulating hormone is switched on on day two and a half of the sun. So as the sun spins, the follicle stimulating hormone starts to produce the hormone. And then it follows the sunspot cycle for 14 days and stops. On the 14th day, we have the follicle stimulating hormone, the red one. In addition, we have the solar cycle itself underneath. So we've got two cycles which add together. That gives us a pulse in the luteinizing hormone, which is this one here. So we get a massive pulse on day 14, and that changes the amount of oestrogen and progesterone being produced by the lining of the womb, which either tells the lining of the womb to accept the egg 
or to reject it and go through the process of menstruation. So what we found was, when I looked into it in a lot of detail, and that's all in the Tutankhamun prophecies, because the ancient civilizations were well aware of this uh, mechanism, what we find is that as the sun spins every 28 days, showers the earth with particles, just as we said before, the particles go up and down every one second, the magnetic field varies every one second, this affects the pineal gland in the female brain, the female brain affects the production of melatonin, the timing hormone, and that affects the production of oestrogen and progesterone, and that's why females menstruate every 28 days. Of course, sometimes you say, ah, oh, well, sometimes it's 32 days and 24. If this goes round, what you'll find is you'll have 28 days, 28 days, 28 days, 32 days, 28, 28, 28, 34 days, 28, 28. So it'll go backwards and forwards as the North Pole slides through the equator. Now, there have been experiments to show that when females are placed underground, this was one in New Scientist in 1989, showing uh, a student, Stephanie Follini, and NASA placed her underground in a cave in New Mexico. She was awake for 35 hours, and then she slept for 10 hours. She lost 17 pounds in weight, and her menstrual cycle stopped. Now, this is very interesting stuff, because now we know if we put pregnant females underground or females underground, they can't have babies. They can't reproduce without the sun. And that's why this is so important. What happens if we put a dog underground? Maybe the dog can't reproduce. What happens if we put a mouse underground? What happens if we put the AIDS virus underground? Would the virus stop replicating? We know when we go out into the sunshine, we get herpes, the cold source, the blister comes out because of the solar radiation. Take away the radiation, we take away the fertility. And this is one of the reasons why we can never leave the planet. I'll go on to that in a second. Now, why don't all females menstruate at the same time? Well, I didn't knock this up over the weekend. Okay. And I assure you, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. But that's a 16-hour version. Now, imagine it like this. Imagine a carousel where the sun is the roof of the carousel. And we have four horses. And let's say you're the manager of the, of the ride, and you stand here, and a female comes along, and she takes her place on the ride, and she sits on the horse. Then the, the, the manager moves the carousel around 90 degrees, and this horse goes up in the air, but the next horse comes down to the ground, and the next passenger gets on board. The manager moves the carousel around another 90 degrees, and passenger number three gets on the, the third horse at the back, and then passenger four gets on, and the ride begins. They're all going up and down at different times, but they're all going up and down every 28 days. And that's what I call asynchronous synchronization. Another effect of the sun is that, as I mentioned earlier, the, around the, uh, because the equator is rotating more quickly than the North Pole and the South Pole, the magnetic field around the equator becomes bent. And in 1962, two engineers, Babcock and Leighton, suggested a process that was going on, saying, well, it looks like the, the magnetic field that goes from north to south is getting wound up around the sun. It's bursting out into these spots. If you look at the sun, you get these black spots. They're magnetic fields. They're magnetism bursting out of the sun, but we see them as black areas. And they're understood pretty well nowadays. When I was at Cranfield and I started to look at the sunspot cycle, I made a graph out of uh, asking the question, when would those three parameters be back together again? And I started the graph by hand, and after about five months, I gave up. So I said to the girl in the computer center, <clears throat> put these figures into the, compu into the computer. 37 days, 26 days, 365.25 days. When will they come back together? She said, well, that's easy. If this is 37, and that's 26, that's 962. And if that's a year, it's 962. I said, well, yeah, I know that. <laughs> but this got, I want to see the graph as it progresses, because I suspect there's a lower common denominator, and they actually come together before that. 
I don't know when it's going to be. Maybe after 500 years. Might be 300 years. I can't see unless I've got a graph. And I can't work out the lowest common denominator because of the fractions involved, the decimal points. So I put them into the computer, and the computer said, OK, we, every 87 days when we took those measurements, we'll have a time interval. So we've got 87, 87, 87, 87, 87, 87, 87. So after 700 days, if we do a graph of the world going around and a graph of the combined magnetic field going around, take one from the other, we come out with this difference graph. The sun, I call it the sunspot graph. And after one, two, three, four, five, six of these, it looks like we get three positives and three negatives, and that is the 11-year sunspot cycle, because we know sunspots come and go every 11 and a half years if we look at the sun. So I looked at the graph, and I saw a few problems coming here, because I could see here, if we look at the shape of this, we've got M, M, V, and then we've got a sort of crown, sort of crown, and a spiky crown. So I thought, if I can find out that pattern, where it is, they must all begin again, because it's the same pattern. So I looked and looked and looked, and after 187 years, they all start off together. There we get the, the, the crown, the crown, the crown, and so on. The M, the M, the M, and the upside down crown, and so on. And then I noticed something quite strange. I noticed these, although this was 700 days, 700, 700, 700, this one was 787. 787. This one was 787. There were anomalies in the graph. And when I started to reconcile these anomalies, and that took me some time, like about two years, to figure it through, I realized that the sun, although it should be positive at the top and negative at the bottom, the equator should be neutral. But what I found was that it's actually warped. It's like an old record. This is, it got broken on the way here today, I'm afraid. But that was an old pop record. I think it was You Are My Sunshine or something like that. <laughs> now, what we know is that this, they call it the neutral sheet. The neutral sheet is warped. We know that. The physicists know that. The astronomers know that. What this graph tells me, which nobody knew, is that every 187 years, that neutral warp moves. Because the graph tells me that after analyzing it for two years. And after another 187 years, this one moves again. And after another 187 years. And in fact, so now we have four variables. We have the pole, the equator, the world, and the neutral warp. So when will they all be back together? Well, the answer to that is 18,169 years. But what did it mean? So I took another look. Well, what it means is that something's interfering with this neutral warp on the sun. We would expect the warp to follow the red line, but it's expect the equator of the sun's magnetic field to be neutral along the red line, but we know it's warped and tilted. And if we look at the, the warp and the tilt, I know these cycles every 11 and a half years are being interfered with along the length. They're being interfered with here, 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 and here on my graph. And when we have a look at the, the sunspot cycles itself over the centuries, we can see that the sunspot amplitude is going up and down in sympathy with this neutral warp. So I thought, well, that's interesting, because if that warp's moving, when will they come back together? What's actually happening? So I had a look at the warp then, and I put, started off with the warp as it is, and I put another one on top, and I said, OK, what happens if the warp moves every 187 years, little bit by bit, like that? It's moving 187 years, like, like so on. And uh, what I discovered was that, excuse me, the magnetic field of the sun, as this moves here, see these arrows? If we put them on top of each other, those are the arrows showing the direction of the magnetic field, that way, that way, that way. If we move them like this over 187 years, we see the magnetic field of the Earth, of the sun, reverses. It goes from negative to positive. Now, I can calculate how long that will take simply by putting those interfere the, the bits that interfere on together. So in other words, these are the bits that interfere here. And I'm saying, when does the black bar hit the next black bar? When does that black bar hit that one? And it's one, 
2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. It's 20, 187 year cycles. That's 20 multiplied by 68,302. That's 1,366,040 days. And that was a number worshipped by the Mayas of Central America. Now, do you see the problems? <laughs> okay? <laughs> this is a, mo a mosaic sun shield from Monte Olban in, in uh, Mexico. It's a sun shield. It has four arrows. It has 85 golden loops or sunspots. And it has 11 pendants. Four times eight times 11 multiplied by 365.25 comes out to be 1,366,040 days. So now you know what you're up against. We know what we're up against. These guys weren't the chimpanzees flying around in trees eating bananas like the archaeologists tell us. These people were smarter than we are today. And if we look at the sunspot graphs, we understand why civilizations rise and fall with sunspots. Because we know sunspots affect fertility. We know how they affect fertility. They affect the particles coming off the sun. That affects the brain. That affects the production of hormones. So every time we get a sunspot cycle, the, the pharaohs died out. The early Greeks died out. We, we, when we have a maximum, we have a pyramid maximum. The Mayas died out in AD 750. We had the Incas died out in 1530. All because the sun failed their fertility needs. There were no babies being born. Not only were there no babies being born, but when that magnetic field reverses, when that neutral warp reverses, what happens to the sun? Well, we can see what happens. If the sun's magnetic field goes that way, if it twists on its axis like that, the earth turns on its axis upside down and we have a pole shift. Now, of course, that doesn't happen every time. These are magnetically coupled. If that moves that way, that moves that way. If that moves that way, that moves that, that way. It's like a compass needle. If you've got a compass, it follows the magnetic field of the Earth. So we know the Maya, we know from that mo mosaic sun shield that the Maya knew the correct number for the sunspot cycle because they encoded it in that mosaic uh, sun shield. And we need to ask, why did they worship another number 520 days longer? 1,366,560 days long. And they measure their calendar from the year 3113 BC. Because they knew in the year 3113 BC, 5,000 years ago, the magnetic field of the sun reversed. They know that. And the planet Venus reversed. The earth did not reverse because we're further away. But they called it the birth of Venus. And that's why Venus now is rotating upside down. And it's very slow because it used to rotate that way quickly. But when it got turned upside down, it slowed down. One day it will stop and start turning the other way again. So they called it the birth of Venus. But I began to suspect with the, as the books came along... Before we do that, I'll just show you Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu, we all know it's in the sky in Peru. And what you probably haven't seen is that, if you've been there, is that all of the windows are bricked up. There are no windows at Machu Picchu, except in the observatory. All of the windows are blocked up. So why build a window and block it up? Melatonin, the jet lag hormone, is maximum at 3 o'clock in the morning when it's dark. And two guys, Pierre Pauli and Regelson, two Americans, doctors, wrote a book in 19, I think it was 99, The Melatonin Miracle. And they said not only does melatonin affect fertility, but electric fields decrease fertility. So if you're in Machu Picchu and you want to get rid of the electric fields, what do you do? You, you earth bond all of the stones in the building to short circuit the electrical energy to ground. And this is why all the stones at Tiwanaku in Bolivia and in Peru have these copper straps in the concrete, in the uh, enchased blocks. So during the Inca minimum, they had a sunspot minimum. And when we have sunspot minimums, we have a mini ice age. When we have a mini ice age, 
we have less evaporation of the water from the oceans. So why didn't everybody in the world die out when we had a sunspot minimum? Because around the equator, around Mexico and Peru, either side of the equator, they had less melatonin and less fertility. It was a sunspot maximum, so we had more x-rays coming off the sun, so we had more spontaneous fetal abortion from the x-rays. X-rays are dangerous if you're pregnant. We had a sunspot minimum, so there was less rain globally all around the world. But in equatorial regions, it was more crucial. So that the people around the equatorial region had famine as well as drought. Okay, who cares? Who cares? Well, this, as I said, this stuff is very, very important. In 1967, a British biologist, Janet Harker, wanted to know, how does a cockroach know when it's midnight? How can it get out of bed at midnight, run around for six hours, and then get tired again and go back to bed? So what she did was she got a cockroach on an electron microscope. She put it to sleep with a little bit of chloroform. She cut its head off with an electron microscope and a scalpel. She put a grid on top of the cockroach with a hundred little grids in it. And she got a little soldering iron and she burnt a hole in one of the squares and put its head back together. Next day, it got up at midnight. Next day, she got a different cockroach and she burnt out the next square. And she did this over and over again, and eventually she reached a part of the brain which when she burnt it out, it didn't wake up at midnight, and it didn't go to bed. It just ran around continuously. So she said, that must be the biological clock. She said, how can I check? So she got an Australian cockroach, and she flew one in. And she put his clock in the English cockroach, and she put the English clock in the Australian's cockroach, and they both went to bed at the opposite time. So she said, it must be the clock. And then she said, I wonder what will happen if we put two clocks in one cockroach. <laughs> so she put two clocks in one cockroach. And every time, they got cancer and died. OK. So let's have a look what's going on. Here we have the sun. The sun's giving out radiation, don't forget. And there's four patterns of radiation. This diagram shows the pattern one, two, three. In other words, <clears throat> this particular month, number four was burned out. <clears throat> so we have this rhythm, this beat, a one, two, three beat. One, two, three. So this sperm and the egg, they come together, and the sun is showering one, two, three on this particular baby, on this particular fetus, or zygote, this sperm as it enters the egg and it starts developing and dividing its cells. And the, and the baby starts developing cells as, a, as it's radiated by this sunshine with a one, two, three beat. The cells be, grow, the cells divide, more cell growth, the, the hormone systems develop. The hormones then feed a signal back to the biological clock. And the biological clock says one, two, three. Great. And it compares the 1, 2, 3 from the hormone system with the 1, 2, 3 from the sun. And it says, are they together? Yep. Yeah. Great. Okay. The sun goes around again, and the sun says, more cells. So the cells divide, and they go around, and they get, no, no problem, great. And the organism grows a bit bigger, they get more hormones, more cells, and, and it grows and grows and grows. So we have a parity checker in the brain, the pineal gland, to make sure that they're both, we don't want that. We, we want them both together, the same code, because we know we've got a healthy baby. What happens if we change the code? Look at this situation. We have the same code coming from the sun, one, two, three, but now you've got a carcinogen coming into the system. Coffee, tobacco, any carcinogen that changes its metabolic rate. Now, we've got one, two, three from the sun here, but the carcinogen's going, hey man, this cigarette's making me go really quickly. And the other one's going like that, and they say, and what happens is, this comparator doesn't switch off the system. And what happens is, we get a cancer loop forming. And so we get cancer, the cells can 
divide, multiply, divide, multiply. They're trying to stop what's happening, so they keep on making more and more cells. And so that's why we're getting cancer. Now, doctors know that chemotherapy only works on one in four. Well, of course it works on one in four, because you've got four types of people. If we could synchronize the chemotherapy with the radiation that that organism requires, then it would be 100% effective. So that's how important it is. And if you look at the sunspot cycle every 11 and a half years, we know that influenza viruses mutate with the sunshine, just like the cold sore, just like the fertility and the hormones. And we know from uh, studies carried out in the UK in 1957 that flu is associated with schizophrenia. So we know the sun is affecting the birth at concep at the organism at conception. That's affecting uh, the baby's brain, and that is resulting in schizophrenic behavior. So, of course, it's very important. Now, the, So we know the Mayas were very clever. The Mayas were also aware that we are very much more complex than how we appear to be. For example, we have four bodies, not, not one. We have the physical body, we have the intellectual body, the brain, and we have the emotional body, the heart, and we have the spiritual body, the aura around us. Now, about four weeks ago, I discovered how gravity works, and it's because of all this which gave me the insight to understand that. And, and Really, that came from understanding the difference between the spirit and the soul, which we'll come on to shortly. Now, the Mayas understood that Maya means illusion. It's an ancient Indian Sanskrit word that goes back 20,000 words. It means illusion, because they believe what we see is not what we see. Everything is inside out, back to front, and upside down. We think we see with our senses, but we don't. And... If we look at uh, the spiritual teachings, for example, what we're told is that God is light. God is electromagnetic energy. In the Bible, Genesis says God created light. But in the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu holy book, for example, it says God is light. The Buddhists believe Buddha was enlightened. He was light. So we don't have to start changing the rules. We don't have to think we're very clever. And in fact, if you think you're clever, you won't get any of this work into your heads at all. You have to stand back with humility and say, I'm completely stupid. And it's the only way we can make discoveries. <clears throat> and indeed, that was how I solved out the gravity enigma just a few weeks ago. And I'll be talking on gravity during this uh, symposium this week. Now, if we look at the scriptures again, the reason I got onto the spiritual aspect, by the way, was because when I started to decode the, the Mayan pictures, it all became quite clear what they were trying to tell us. If you remember earlier, there were two numbers, the sunspot cycle number and the number which was slightly bigger, the birth of Venus number. The sunspot cycle, just to go over it once more, was 1,366,040 days, but the Maya, which the Maya knew of because they put it into the sun shield. But they worshipped another number and they documented it in the ancient Bark books, the Dresden Codex, for example. And they referred to it as the birth of Venus. So I'm thinking at this stage, it's when Venus turned upside down, which is true, which is like every 3,740 years, one million days. But on the last page of the Bible... Jesus says in the book of Revelation, I, Jesus, am the bright and morning star. The bright star is the bright star at night in the dark sky. And the morning star is the morning star, which are both manifestations of the planet Venus. It's not a star, it's a planet. Sometimes, I've got some diagrams coming up in a minute. I'll go into that in more detail in just a few moments. Just getting back to God, what, what is God? God is electromagnetic energy, accept it. The Bible also says God made man in his own image. And it seems that God can do anything 
except grow, because mankind can't grow beyond a certain size. It might be 5 foot 10 inches tall, it might be 18 inches wide, but we can only grow to a certain limit. If we want to grow any further, we have to throw a piece of ourselves away and create a baby, then that grows. So the only no if an apple tree wants to grow, it has to throw an apple away. The only known mechanism in the physical world, which is where the physical body lives, is to throw, sacrifice a piece of ourselves and we begin to grow. So God can do anything, it seems, except grow. Well, I was always taught that God was love and God was good, so the only thing better than God must be more God, but God can't grow. So that must be very frustrating for God. So I thought, well, how about if I was God and I threw a piece of myself away? How would that work? So, <laughs> okay, I've got them. I was just looking for some blank. Uh, no, I haven't. Here's a, here's a half blank one. I'll use this one. Okay, okay. Let's say God in the, in the beginning is a thousand volts. Electromagnetic energy. God is like a thousand volts. So, he wants to grow, so he knows he has to throw some of himself away. So he throws 50 volts away. And he goes, so what we find is E equals MC squared. What we find is, now I know you don't like formulas, there's a little one. If you can't remember it, Einstein equals Morris Cottrell squared. Okay? He's a lot smarter than I am. So, here we have a thousand volts, which is God. And God threw a piece of himself away, which went across the equation in the beginning. Now, whenever you go across an equation, if this is a thousand volts, and God throws away 50 volts, then this mass, this is a physical world, this is everything in the universe, the mass must be opposite what God was, because it's gone across the equation. It's very simple. So, it's minus m. And this is the speed of light squared, which is 300 million. That's a big number. So when you squash E, when you throw some E away, you get a big bang, which is the atom bomb. This is how the atom bomb works. Throw some energy away, squash all the atoms together. The bang you will get is 300 million times bigger than what you started with. And the mass, everything in the physical world, is opposite what God is. So what have we got in the physical world? Well, we've got overhead projectors, we've got cups, we've got shirts, we've got human beings. And we know everything in the physical world is opposite God. So if God is God, everything in the physical universe must be the devil. <laughs> it must be. There are no other ways of looking at it. And this must be hell. And it is hell. And I'll prove it to you in the next few hours. <laughs> and this is why everything is illusion. Now what happens when, we sacrifice, when God sacrificed a piece of himself in the beginning here, we had the physical world is created. So we have light in the beginning. That light, the thousand volts, creates God. We get the big bang and we get the physical universe, which is the stars and the planets and everything else, are created. But we're not very bright, we're chimpanzees. And we've not got very much current flow going around the body and we haven't got very much of a brain intellectually. But with evolution and millions and thousands of years, we develop into ostensibly intelligent human beings. And when our brain reaches a certain voltage, we rip another piece of, don't forget, we are minus five volts. My blood, my heart is pumping the blood. The blunt is developing voltages across all my neurons. 
So my brain develops a voltage, say minus two volts. That minus two volts rips another two volts off God. And that little two volts attaches to me in my mother's womb. So I'm now two volts negative and two volts positive, which is zero volts. Now I'm a human being. Half devil, half God. See? <laughs> Clever, isn't it? And it gets better. So, let's have a look at the rules of the physical world. You see, the physical world say, says, if I have a dollar and you have a dollar, and I give you my dollar and you give me your dollar, we have a dollar. Which means we can't get something for nothing. But the intellectual world, for example, isn't like that. Because if I have an idea and you have an idea and we exchange them, I have two ideas and you have two ideas. And it doesn't cost anything. So we can double our intellectual wealth at no cost. Now, if I love you, my voltage goes up. If I hate you, my voltage goes down. If I love you, then my voltage grows from 2 volts to 100 volts. Then when my energy leaves my body, it can leave this physical hell, escape the Earth's gravity, and it goes back to God, who becomes 1,100 volts, because he's got my soul. So God has grown, which is good. So what we find is, if we love each other, our soul voltage grows, and we go back to God, and God grows. If we hate each other, our soul voltage falls, and it can't get off the earth. So if it falls from two volts in the beginning, don't forget it was two volts, if I hate you and it goes down to half a volt during my lifetime, then it will come, it, that half a volt will look for a half a volt baby. It's not going to look for a two volt baby. <laughs> it's going to look for a, a half a volt baby, which isn't as strong as a two volt baby. It's not as clever as a two volt baby. It's not as happy as a two volt baby. So we're in hell. Abandon hope, all you eat who enter, says Dante. And the problem is, as we know, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get to heaven. And the reason is, if I'm bought rich and I have servants, I say, that floor's not very clean. Clean it. And the person on the floor says, why are you kidding me? What have I done to you? And the person on the floor is hurt. And when the heart suffers... The heart purifies. And when the heart purifies, the voltage increases. So the person on the floor starts to go to heaven every time he's kicked. But the person doing the kicking starts to go to hell because his voltage still goes down. And if we look at the information from the Mayas, they tell us that there are three worlds. We have the God world, the physical world, which we see around us. We have the soul world, which is where all souls go after they leave the body, some souls go to the paradises where they're not really bad ones. These aren't too bad at all. So they get purified in the soul world after 3,740 years in purgatory where the heart is purged of sin. All these pictures have been put down by the Mayas and I'll show you some of them. They go back to God and God grows. So mankind is a, is a conduit, a channel for making God grow. The impure souls go to the underworld, and if you, your voltage is half a volt, you might come back and be a cockroach, a half a volt cockroach. Or, or you might be a million, one millivolt mosquitoes. So you come back as a ball of mosquitoes. And this is why this happens. This is why you get a flocks, of, flocks of birds, they all turn at the same time, because it's the same soul. And bundles of midgets, and they all move at the same time. They stay in the ball. Because it's like throwing a brick into a car windscreen. You might have one volt to start off with, but when you throw the brick, it can shatter. You don't just have a nervous breakdown in the physical world. You can have a nervous breakdown in your soul. And that can go back as a hundred souls. 
And this is why the Maya say everything is illusion. I had a friend who's 80 years old and lives in England. And we went on a walk one day and he said, I can't understand, Morris, why the Maya say this is illusion. And he picked up a flower. He said, look, that flower, it looks like a flower, smells like a flower, feels like a flower. What's the problem? Well, I didn't want to hurt his feelings. So that night over dinner and three bottles of wine, I said, Ron, do you remember that conversation we were having? He said, yes. I said, look, that flower was a biological system. It had a voltage on it. It, it, it had God in it. The soul, it had a soul attached to it. In two weeks' time, the plant will die and the soul will be released. If it's pure soul, which it isn't, because it's only a flower, it has to get to mankind to be that higher voltage, then it will escape the Earth's atmosphere. If not, it will come back and the flower, in three weeks' time, may be a worm because it will attach itself to a voltage which is equal and opposite to itself, exactly. And it might be a worm for a month and its voltage might go up and it might come back as a mouse and it might come back as an eagle and its voltage will keep going up. And this is a problem. As our voltage goes up, in one lifetime we become more intelligent and more loving because, don't forget the body is the devil and what the Indians tell us in the Bhagavad Gita is that if we have a look at the body, they compare it to five horses that represent the five senses of the body. And the reins are the intellect. The brain is the driver. And the soul is a passenger. And it's up to the intellect, the driver, to hold back the horses from running away. You see, we've got the eye, uh, the nose, and so on, on each horse. The eyes, the nose, the ears, the mouth, the touch. If we re use the mind to hold back the body, then we'll have a peaceful ride on Earth. So what happens is we get, our voltage goes up as we evolve. We're here for thousands of years, millions of years we live for. We've been back many, many times. You guys especially at this conference have been back many, there are old souls and young souls. You are all old souls or you wouldn't be here. Not my words. We get to a certain voltage, but as we get to a higher voltage, we have more money and we're healthier and we start to abuse the people around us. And so the voltage goes down the next time. And it's like being in an elevator in a tall building. You go from the fifth floor to the second floor, ninth floor to the third floor, 50th floor to the 12th floor, to the 11th floor, and so on. And we can't get to the roof, to the helicopter to take us to heaven. And this is why we're in prison. This is a prison. This is where we live. And people say to me very often, well, how do we love our neighbor? Because clearly if you love, your voltage will grow. That's the key. Jesus had the key. And I said, well, it seems to me that the biggest problem to me in this world is that people have likes and dislikes. And the problem is, if you dislike something, if this is normal, if you like, if you dislike something, you could hate it. Disliking is a first step to hate. And that's the problem with the world is hate. So it seems to me that we have to get rid of dislike, get rid of this disliking thing. It's no good to us. But the only way to get rid of disliking is to like, get rid of liking. Yeah. And we have to get rid of liking. It might sound unpleasant, but we have to. So you say, well, I can't get my head around that. What do you mean? And I said, well, look, okay, take red peppers. Red peppers make me feel sick. I don't dislike red peppers. Lots of people enjoy red peppers. God made red peppers for all of humanity. And we're all different. And God's not stupid. If you think God would make something that's inherently bad, then there's something wrong with the way you're thinking. God is clever. And I know God is clever. It would be a slight on his intelligence to suggest otherwise. So I don't need to dislike red peppers. I avoid them. Simple. I don't like red peppers. I don't like bananas. I enjoy them or avoid them. It's simple. And if we get rid of this liking and disliking, then you can't dislike a person because you know God created them. God loves everybody, all six billion of us. You know, why do you think, you know, some people think God's stupid. Why do you think God went to all that trouble to make us all different? Earth signs, fire signs, water signs, air signs. 
It could have been like Henry Ford, made them all the same. Spare parts would be cheaper. Who would make six billion people all different? You see, with four types of people, four astrological signs, we all argue all the time, which is great. Because think about what it would be like if we all agreed. You know, isn't that a nice picture? Yeah, that's a wonderful picture. Well, I wouldn't do another one, would I? What if somebody said, oh, I've had a bad day, I'm going to commit suicide? Well, I agree, I'm going to commit suicide. (laughs) And everybody commits suicide. So God would stop growing, wouldn't he? So God's got to make sure that we all disagree. And so this is an important part of the mechanism of life on earth. Which is why we'll never go to another planet. I mean, this is your domain now. If we go to another planet which doesn't have a sun like ours, we're all going to be the same. If we use artificial insemination and fertility pills, we're all going to think the same. And sooner or later, we'll all kill ourselves on that planet, whether it be Mars or wherever. So we have to find a sun which has two magnetic fields where they rotate at different speeds, where they produce the right hormones to give us four types of star sign to all make us disagree so we can all be happy. (laughs) Easy, isn't it? So how are you... Now I know... I figured all this out because I was rich in this life because I had an education. I could think this stuff through. That's when I say rich, because I I was able to do this. I don't mean money. But I know next time, if I'm not very careful, I'll come back as a poor person. Now Jesus says, give all your wealth away and follow me. It's difficult, isn't it? You go to the bank manager and say, I'd like to take all my money out because I'm giving it away. Difficult, isn't it? So I think, well, okay, what's the next best thing? If I write all this information down, the next time I come back, if I read it, (laughs) I'll come back rich and go to heaven. Because I'll know what to do and how to live. And I'll know that this is hell. Now, I could write it down in pictures, like this Aztec calendar, and explain how the world ended on four previous magnetic reversals in the last 18,169 years. This is the Aztec calendar. Or I could encode it in numbers. Don't forget, a a picture's worth a thousand words. But some stuff like 26, 37, 1366040, 18,100. Very difficult to put that in a picture because the language will change. You know, when the Spaniards invaded Mexico, they stopped speaking the Quishmaya tongue. They started to speak Spanish. So the numbers might change, the language changes. So I've got to make it more permanent. So I need to encode numbers of the sun's rotation, a very important, 26, 28 if you're on the earth, 37 or 41 if you're on the earth, 96, that's the number of magnetic sunspot cycles, 97 if you're going to count the one that includes the 18,000 year cycle, the number of magnetic shifts, 20, if we're talking about magnetic reversal, The 1366040, if we're talking about rises and falls of civilization. And 1366560, if we're talking about Venus. So we're going to go down to Mexico now. And we're going to have a look at the Temple of Inscriptions at Palenque. Because it was there in 1952 that the archaeologist Alberto Ruz took the paving slab off the top of the pyramid here He scratched out the mortar filling from those holes and he found a staircase running down inside the pyramid here. 26 steps. He then turned to his right along a landing and went down 22 steps. There was four more inside the tomb at the bottom, which he later discovered. So 26 altogether. Again, there was a brick wall at the end with a stone box. In the stone box, there was a pearl in a seashell. The pearl represents the planet Venus and rebirth in ancient civilizations. And some of the numbers the ancient civilizations used, like 666, the mark of the beast in the Bible, uh, they used those to convey the information which we're talking about. 
And they also used 999. Well, if 666 is hell, what do you think 999 might be? Heaven. Yeah, it's a good idea, isn't it? Okay. Well, why would the pearl be in the cinnabar? Well, the pearl is Venus, and the atomic number of cinnabar, the, the powdered form of liquid, the liquid metal mercury, is 80. It means it's got 80 protons in the middle. So the pearl in the seashell is number 81. Now, I know that because when I was studying Tutankhamun, he had 143 pieces of jewelry inside his bandages. He was number 144 of the 144,000 that go to heaven, the purified ones in Revelation. So the pearl in the cinnabar is number 81, which is nine nines. Nine, 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 nine. So immediately, has this tomb got something to do with heaven? The, the door to the tomb was triangular. They demolished the, the stone chest, which had 11 jade beads, three red painted shells, and three plates. And they entered the tomb in 1952. July. And Alberto Ruz noticed that there was five beams holding up the ceiling, six pillars on the wall, that the, the sarcophagus lid here had two corners missing. And of course, what's missing isn't missing if you're a Mayan. And what's not missing is, is missing. And uh, the sarcophagus inside had one of the corners chopped off. So that was the sarcophagus lid. It weighs five tons, 12 foot long, six feet wide, Solid limestone, so big they can't remove it from the tomb. And the body was kept in this sarcophagus, which had a missing corner at the bottom here. And the carving on the sarcophagus was very popular in the 1960s because Eric von Däniken said it might be a guy in a spaceship. But this was going to be much more than any of those things because the triangular door represented a journey into the mind. When we examine the, the uh, pyramid... Just going back to that picture we saw a few moments ago, the paving stone at the top, there were two holes in one corner, two holes in the other corner, two holes in the other corner, two holes in the other corner, and there were two plaster heads on the floor showing the man in the tomb, Lord Pekal. That was one of them. And that was the other one. There were three clay plates in the stone chest, three red painted shells, three sides to the door tomb, three jade beads, one, the man in the tomb, the bones of the man in the tomb, had a jade bead in his right hand, a jade bead in his left hand, and a jade bead in his mouth. And he had a necklace around his neck with three levels on it. There were four steps down to the tomb itself. The man had four jade rings on his left hand, four jade rings on his right hand. There were four pairs of holes in the slab at the top. And there were four concrete plugs, or limestone plugs, holding down the lid of the tomb. There were five pyramid landings, five temple stairways, five male skeletons, five ceiling beams, five sarcophagus sides. There were six temple pillars, six sides of the tomb, but there were no more sixes in the temple at, at uh, Palenque in Mexico. The numbers 666 were missing. At least they were missing until we had a look at the necklace around the man's neck. And when we have a look at the necklace, we find out we have 13 beads, which is 6 plus 7. We had another 13 beads, which is 6 plus 7, and another 13 beads, 6 plus 7, which gives us the three missing 6s, 6, 6, 6, and throws up three seven, 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 seven. There's another 7 there, but we're still missing a 7. Here we have 15, which is 7 plus 8, which gives us the last 7 and the first of the 8s. Now, the Maya used a bar and dot system to count. 5 was a bar, 1 was a a dot was one, so five, six, seven, eight, five, six, seven, eight, five, six, seven, eight, five, six, seven, eight, which gives us the five eights, including the one from the fifteen. There were nine steps at the bottom of the pyramid, nine pyramid levels, nine steps at the top, nine paintings on the wall, and nine codes down either side of the lid. If we now take nine of the Maya calendar cycles, they measured time in cycles of twenty day periods. Not weeks, they didn't use seven days, they used 20. 260-day periods, 360-day periods, 7,200-day periods, and 144, that's where their counting stopped. If we take nine of those, 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 we come up with 
560 days, which is the birth of Venus number. Now, this Venus number, as I explained earlier, is slightly different to the, the, the uh, Sun Shield number. And that's because if we look at Venus here, the morning star, it's, it's rising. So as the, the sun rises that morning, we will see Venus on the right. But 112 days later from the Earth, Venus will actually be on this side of the sun. So the only time we'll see it is when it sets in the east. And then we'll see it left behind as a bright evening star. And I, when I went to Guadalajara, I saw this shrine in the temple there. And of course, Jesus said in St. John, I have said to you that I will go away and come unto you again. I, Jesus, am the bright and shining morning star. And there we see Jesus with Joseph and Mary with the, the twin planets, Venus, as a morning star and the evening star with a bright star of Bethlehem above on his head. Now, once I started to decode all this stuff, I had another look at the carving on the lid, and it, it became quite clear that these people were geniuses. Of course, it was easy to just put down the sun in this design, and two dragons, which represents the sun, and a woman being licked by the sun god here for fertility. There we have the sun god in the middle of the Aztec calendar, and we also have carvings in Mexico of the sun is trying to tell us that the sun was killing us. The sun's rays was causing the babies here to die. And the babies had a circle on their chest representing the sun. Solar babies are here. So we have babies and we have the sun which was killing the babies because of lack of fertility and because of x-rays. And the sun god, his tongue's out and he's licking the female to make her more, fer more fertile. So yes, clearly we could have a picture like that. We'll be taking a break in just about 10 minutes. I just want to show you one of the miracles before you have your whatever. The next picture we could say, we could say, this isn't, I haven't even started yet, we could say that this particular picture, if we colour in different parts of that design, represents the age of water by this lady here, Chalchi Whitliqui. She was a goddess of water who wore a jade skirt. So maybe this is, just maybe, maybe this is Chalchi Whitliqui in the bathtub, holding a lily, lily leaf in her left hand. Well, if that's Chalchi Whitliqui, the goddess of water, who ruled the age of water for 3,740 years before the world came to an end because of the flood, maybe this eagle could represent the, the Ekatl, the god of wind when the world was destroyed by hurricanes. And maybe this one, this stylized representation, could represent Claloc. There's lots of carvings like this in, in Central America with his distinctive teeth and his ears and so on. He was the god of rain, but volcanic rain, and when the world was destroyed through volcanic eruptions. And as we've already seen, this could be the sun god when the world was destroyed by the sunspot cycle. And if we look at Mayan mythology, Perhaps the lid tells us other stories of where we go when we die. One of the stories says that there's a place of, uh, called Tamawanchan where the babies go when they die. So maybe this area here on the lid represents Tamawanchan, the place where dead babies go when they die. Maybe this area represents Adam and Eve. Of course, one of them's missing. So that's not so certain. Uh, there are some corn seeds down here, so the archaeologists tell us. Maybe those corn seeds represent the paradise called Chincalco. That's where women went who died in childbirth. Perhaps this is a woman dying in childbirth going to that paradise. So this particular picture tells us about all of the other paradises. Now, the Popol Vuh, the book of the Maya, it begins and ends with the same words. The Popol Vuh, the original Bible, as it is called, cannot be seen anymore. The book was written long ago, but now it is hidden to the searcher and to the thinker. A very cryptic beginning. And it says exactly the same thing on the end. The Popol Vuh, as it is called, cannot be seen anymore. The original book 
was written long ago, but now its sight is hidden for the searcher and the thinker. Now, I want to just briefly do an experiment with you to show you how the brain works. If I asked you a question, that's a picture, a jigsaw puzzle picture of an English country garden. It's not very clear because the projector's awful. And I said to you, what's so unusual about that picture, or different, or special? What would you say to me? Well, the brain doesn't like questions like that, because right now it's going one way, it's saying, what's he talking about? What is, what's so special? I, I don't understand the question. What does he mean? Let me ask you another question. Here is a picture of an English country garden. What's so special about that picture? Pictures are missing. <laughs> the pieces are missing. Aren't you clever? You don't know how clever you are. Because you didn't see what was there. You can only see what's not there. You don't see me. You see somebody who's too tall or too short or too fat or too thin. Or who talks too fast or talks too slowly. You don't see your son or your daughter. You say, why can't you wash the dishes and help your mother? Why can't you cut the grass and help your father? We only ever see the bits that are missing. So I want to leave all of this information so that when I come back in 3,000 years' time, I can find it again. So how am I going to do it? When I went to Palenque, I said to the, gu the guide, where are the two pieces off the corners? He said, I'd never noticed. <laughs> and I can understand why, because they, this is so big they can't get it out of the pyramid. But the archaeologists are really switched on. They've made a replica in the museum, it's around the corner. But they fixed the corners. Because <laughs> they weren't there. So if you go to the museum in Palenque, You'll see a fiberglass model of this, just a hundred yards from the pyramid, and the corners are perfect. But when you go into the pyramid, you'll see they're missing. What's not there is there, and what is there is missing, because I understand the Mayas. Now, this is, where, this is why now you'll understand my frustration with this projector in a few minutes. If we look at the pattern on the corner there, this is, the board, this is lid, I call it the lid of Palenque. It's grey now because if it's not grey, the black lines interfere with the picture, so I had to turn them grey on the computer. Without the computer in uh, 1985 and the colour photocopier, none of this work would have been possible. And I said to myself, if they're not missing, I'll just put those on top of each other to, just to show you that I'm not cheating. There's nothing there. I just colored in a few colors and laid them on top of each other for now. But what I want you to look at is the corners right now. This corner, we've got a sort of star shape made up out of dots. And this one, we've got like magnetic lines. So I thought, if they're not missing, they must still be there. So I've got to use a bit of lateral thinking and find them. So what I did was, I made a transparent photocopy put one on the other and overlaid them. And what we see is that the pattern is restored. Can you see that? I found the missing corner. Now, can you see it? It's important. Little crooked. Have I? That's okay. It's very important. Just a second. Point one of a degree and you won't see it. Very, very critical. And you'll see just what geniuses we're playing with. I can't see now because this is burning my eyes out. And I can't find my glasses without my glasses. <laughs> I'll, I'll try anyway. We're coming to a break in a second. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Now, the trouble is then, the ones at the bottom are not completed. They're skew with, they're out. So if I put them there together, you see the ones at the bottom are completed? Can you see that? They're completed now, the loops. 
See? And now we can see a load of pictures down that border. If I try and straighten them up slightly. But they're not very persuasive yet. So let me turn those up like that. So where it should be. Okay, can you see the picture of the tiger? Three quarters of the way down. The tiger's head. I'll, I'll show you them to a bit clearer now. Because there are several steps. So we started off colouring in the corners. Then we took a mirror image and put the corners together here, but notice this corner was not together. So then we separated them so that this corner was together, but this corner is no longer together. And when we did that, we coloured in the edges down here, put them both back to back, and we came out with four patterns. The head of a bird, a human face wearing a blindfold with butterflies on his lips, something that looks like a tiger, and something that looks like a dog with a blindfold. But these are very inconclusive and not persuasive. So we need to do a little bit more research. I'll just blow them up again. There's the bird face. To the eyes, the nostrils, the beak. Then we have the human face with a butterfly shape on each lip. Now I know this. This is the god of ice and the god of... This is Venus. Venus was the god of ice in the morning, the ice crystals. Clahuis Kapaltikutli, his name was. And he wore a blindfold, and the blindfold was made out of the skin of a sacrificed victim. I know what I'm looking for, but you won't at this stage. I understand that. And we have the sun, the jaguar, and the sunspot cycle. And we have Venus in the morning, in the evening, Jolotol, the dog who was blind. He wore a blindfold and carried bones in his teeth. And if we look at the borders around the lid, we notice that... All of the borders, when we put them together, has got these composites of the Mayan gods. But we have to line up these dots every time, exactly. And also another picture, when we put the borders together, is a picture of a bat. And the Mayans worship the bat as a god of fertility. So, <clears throat> if we take a look at that, and we say, okay, we've got some pretty nondescript pictures around the outside. It could be anything, it could be something from the grocery store. You say it's a, a dog with bones in its teeth, who cares? Fine, okay. I'm going to have to ask you to look at this one now a little bit more closely because what's so special about that picture? <laughs> now that is a difficult one. Apart from the missing corners, of course. Now, so I said, well, I don't know because I've never seen one before. So, okay, I'll start here. And this is what I did for 10 months. I started there and I thought, what could that be? I thought, I don't know, I've never seen one before. I thought, what could that be? Never seen one before. What could that be? Never seen one before. Eventually, I got to the last bit, didn't I? I had to start at the wrong end. And I said, what's that? That's a bit unusual. I've seen one of them before. That's a man. It's a man's head, that. Isn't that interesting? So I thought, well, I've not seen one of those before. It looks like he's got a banana on his nose. I've never seen a man with a banana. Must be a mistake. How can I get rid of the banana and make it perfect? Because we are born to make ourselves perfect. Easy. Don't need rocket science to work this out. I could get some scissors, but I haven't got any. It's a thousand years ago, remember? Tipex. No, no Tipex. I've got this, haven't I? I've got that. I wonder if by using that, I could get rid of the banana. Yes, I can. Now, all I've got is two guys with their noses touching. Can you see that? Are you sure it's important? You can see it. Okay. Let's have another look at the picture. What's so special about that picture? got a banana on his nose. What are we going to do? We're going to get rid of it. How are we going to get rid of it? We're going to use two acetates. So I'm going to selectively colour in these pictures now. And there are rules. It's like painting by numbers. They're very strict rules. <clears throat> I can fill in an area with colour, but I can't go over the line. That's cheating. So all I've done there is I've filled in a few colours, because it took me 10 months to find this picture of 10 hours a day. 
So I've just put some colours in there, and the same on the bottom. But it's just a load of rubbish. I've just filled in some of the areas. Now, I know this part is the epicentre of this particular picture. picture. There are more than 100 pictures in here, moving videos. This is the first one. Now, what I'm going to do is, I've been told to remove the banana off his nose. There's the banana. There's his head in grey. There's the banana on the end of his nose. So I'm going to put another one now on there. Like so. And there we have the bat god. We have his eye, his eye, his nose, his mouth, and these dots line up. Line those dots up and then remove the banana off his nose. We have the bat god flying towards us. That is the bat god for the Mayas. Do you see that? And we have the bat god flying away from us at the lower part of the picture, which is there, with his wings open this time. And here we have four dashes. Dash, 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 which is 20. And we have five dots on the top, which is 25. This tells us there are 25 pictures in the border code. There are 20 corresponding to 25 pictures in the main part of the carving. So the bat god tells us that there are 25 codes in here. It's an index, a list of contents. Once we match those contents, we can find the hidden picture in the middle of the lid. For example, these were the two heads we saw at the bottom of the tomb earlier, Lord Pekau. And everything is crucial. This crack here is very important. This circle here is very important. Everything is for a reason. Lord Pekau has a high hairstyle here and a low hairstyle there. So you know this because these are in the tomb. So let's have a look at, once I've found the 25 pictures in the border code, and I've found 25 pictures in the middle, I was left over with some border codes that I couldn't reconcile. I found the bat in the border, I found the bat in the middle. I found this picture in the border, I found that picture in the middle. And after I'd gone around them all, I couldn't find a home for these pictures in the border. This picture says, small guy here, hands on his chest, bare feet, closed eyes, he's got a halo on his head, a sunspot magnetic loop. He's just sitting there, lying there. That's the man in the tomb, got to be, his hands on his chest. He's got a bird on his head. It's the eye, the eye, the beak, and his wings are open, like a bird coming down. We've got the sun god from the Aztec calendar. He's got a magnetic loop on his head. He's the sun. And we've got two ear shapes here. So what could it mean? To see the man in the tomb, look for a bird on his head. To see the man in the tomb with a bird on his head, look... He's the, to see the man in the tomb with a bird on the head, who is the sun god... Put the ears together, opposite each other. So they're giving me instructions. So, there's the ear shape here. As I say, I'm sorry about the projector. I'm trying to move it so that you can see the, the best part. There's the ear shape there. This time the colours are more complex, but you can see the painting by numbers technique now, how critical it is to stick to the areas and not to spill over. That's, it's just rubbish, there's nothing there right now. But I've been told to put the ears opposite each other. So first of all, I'll line them up to start off, just so you know there's no cheating. There's nothing there, just the original design with a few colours in it. I've been told to turn them over, put the ears opposite each other. There's one ear and there's the other. There's the two ears together now. And look for a bird on the head. Well, I can't see a bird on the head. But n oh, now I know there's an epicenter to every picture because I've, I'm getting used to it. The epicenter for this picture, if we draw a cross right across them, is that little red dot. See this dot? So I'm going to put that red dot, now the ears are opposite, slide them across so the little red dot is on top of itself. Now I know it's an epicenter, so then it says, Look for a bird on his head. So now I have to rotate it 
and there we have the bird on his head. A little bird with a chain in its mouth. And there we have underneath the bird a picture of the man in the tomb. Let me show you a clearer one. I've taken the grey away now and made it white. Can you see that? Now, he's got a bat mask over his face. I'll show you the bat mask in a few minutes. <clears throat> I'll keep you out of your waiting. This is Viracocha from a tomb in Peru. And here we see Viracocha with a bat mask over his face with four sets of feathers on his head. Now, of course, he lived <clears throat> 300 years before Lord Pekal, but in his tomb, we find this little man, a golden man with his arms up, with corks on his head, on his hat, for flies, to keep the flies away. This little man is across Lord Pekal's face in the tomb at Palenque, and we see he's got a pure heart here. It's going back to the Palenque model. So now we see the small man here with his arms in the air, with his pure heart. And on his head, he's got some numbers. If you look closely, if you look at those numbers, we've got 1440000. That's backwards, that's a Maya. The backwards, 1440, a Maya 0, Maya 0. He's got 144,000 on his head. And in the book of Revelation in the Bible, it says those with 144,000 carved on their heads will be the ones who will go to heaven when the world is saved. This picture can only be seen when each of these acetates, trans, you call them mylars, I think. We call them acetates, so forgive me. It can only be seen when this one is turned 7.2 degrees and this one is turned 7.2 degrees. When the difference between them is 144 degrees, 14.4 degrees, we get this picture on his forehead, 144,000. When they're turned at 7 degrees, not 7.2, 7 and 7, just two-tenths of a degree, the man with a pure heart, his heart completes and becomes pure. It's a heart shape. And so... We're told, if you want only those with a pure heart at 7 and 7, 7 degrees and 7 degrees, will become, we see now, that, isn't, that doesn't say 144,000. It's a bit gobbledygook. This one says 144,000 because I've moved it from this position. From 7 degrees to 7.2, the number only appears at 7.2, so only those with a pure heart will go to heaven. And we have to take a break there so they can change the audio tapes in the background. But the amazing lid of Palenque, that carving you saw, has over a hundred stories like this. It tells us what heaven is, what hell is, what life's all about, why we, why we are born, why we die, why this has to be. And, okay, let's leave it there. <clears throat>